So what I thought is what we do is I had hoped we would have a little bit of a background to talk about haploid integral transplant. But uh, as all my colleagues on the panel and all of my listeners know, this has been the single biggest innovation that has happened in stem cell transplant since ever we started doing transplants. And I think it has brought about a complete paradigm change, which has changed the way that we have been able to do transplants. I certainly remember about 10, 15 years ago when we started, uh, MUDs were kind of out of our reach, really, until uh, the amazing team led by uh, Dr. Lushnik kind of introduced her to the wonders how we can we would be able to do haploidentical transplants with outcomes which are very, very great. And his innovation in using post-transplant cyclophosphamide meant that nowadays almost each and every transplanter who are with me now are able to offer it to many more of our patients than we could have. So what I thought is our plan of a session would be something that we would be having some individual questions directed at individual experts who I'll be invited to speak first on the topic. We will have some slides to assist in the discussion and my other experts are absolutely welcome to join in later with their comments, insights with their experts. We would have a few cases to discuss and this would be focused on uh, the three of the commonest indications that we do in transplants. We'll be talking about malignancies, about acute leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and a little bit on lymphomas. And then we end up with some final thoughts as to which way we would be moving. So uh, it's my pleasure to ask uh, Sunil, uh, Dr. Sunil Bhatt with our first question. And this is like we all have been doing haploidentical transplants in increased numbers over the last few years. So what is it that's made haploidentical transplants such an attractive proposition? What are the advantages that we have with the haplotransplant? Over to you, Sunil. So good afternoon and thank you, Shantanu and, um, and the team for this opportunity. I think, um, uh, you know, as, as you said, probably this is one of the, the greatest, uh, um, you know, I would say additions to this, to the transplant world in the last decade or so. So what are the advantages? The advantages is one that, you know, um, as we know, which is a very relevant in our setting, especially is that to find a match sibling donor. Um, you know, 25, 30 odd percent, maybe another 10 percent, we get a mud donor in our setting, which is, of course, not the case with uh, with the West, you know, as, as you know, uh, Adam was mentioning that they do get mud donors for most of their most of their patients. But in our settings, you know, about 60 odd percent patients will not have a donor to donate for them who's a fully matched. So hence, you know, it makes it very important to have an alternative donor for them. And which could be, you know, um, a, a, you know, sibling, which could be parents, you know, in adults, it could be an offspring. So, you know, practically you get a donor for each and every patient, you know, to who get donated for them. So that, 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 you know, uh, bridges the gap between need for a transplant and need for a donor. So that's one. The second is, you know, uh, they're the family members, so they're highly motivated. So, so the problem of uh, backouts and, um, and, and the time delay uh, which is there in uh, in in uh, in getting a mud donor to donate the cells is not there. So you can you have a donor next to you, and anytime you can take them for transplant. You also have a donor available for a post transplant, um, you know, um, therapies which can be a retransplant. Sometimes it, unfortunately rejection has happened, or for a DLI. Uh, so they have got you have got uh, you know them next to you for for those uh, treatments. Um, also important is. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, some of the benefits, for example, uh, it has been seen now that haplodonors, especially with the, uh, both with, in fact, with the T-cell depletion as this post the cyclophosphamide, the chronic GVHD is, is very less. And that impact is, uh, is an important, um, you know, um, aspect, especially in pediatric, pa you know, patients. And lastly, you know, cost is an important factor. Economics play a huge role in our settings. Um, and the haplodonors, especially if you're using a post-transfer cyclophosphamide strategy, the cost of the transplant does come down as compared to mud transplant. So see, these are some of the advantages, you know, where haplo kind of scores over uh, if you know, alternative donor transplants in, in absence of a mass splitting donor transplant. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Sunil. So that's basically what we were talking about, that if you have a donor now with a haplo, realistically, each and every patient can have a donor. And as you said, that we have problems with uh, the registries that uh, people from ethnic minority, minorities, pe people from uh, uh, third world countries, you may not have a donor for patients on the registries. And for them, yeah, I mean, haplo might be the only kind of option that we have. I'll go on to my next question, which is to my friend Satendra. 
And so, I mean, if we saying haplos so good that it why is not the panacea for all our transplants? Are there any problems? Are there any drawbacks with a haploidentical transplant? Thanks, Shatnu, for the question. Good afternoon and good morning to all the panelists. And hi, Adam. So uh, I'm such a big believer of haplo. So it's very difficult for me to say this as a drawback. I take it as a challenge. So uh, when I look at the haplo, I feel like you know, 50% match, 60%, 70% means there is something which is not matching. And something which is not matching and you are in a country where transfusion uh, services sometimes can be a challenge. There are likelihood that you will transfuse with some donor where those mismatching antigens are matching. It. And in, in a way, you end up having anti-HLA antibodies and that leads to rejection and rejection you know, in a country like ours means nightmare because then first you have to deal with the aplasia, MDR sepsis or whatever. And, you know, the second real challenge with HEPLO is that, you know, because of the delayed immune reconstitution. So the biggest, uh, you know, I would call it the biggest invention of transplant if immune reconstitution was still okay. But the biggest challenge come with this PTSI technique is that you are wiping out almost everything right, for some few good days. And then immunity constitution is a bit slow in haplotransplant and that leads a lot of reactivation. So these are the two things which actually makes me, you know, plan before the start of the transplant. I don't call them drawback. I call them challenge and I, I, I feel very happy to take them. Right. Thanks. Very much, Satendra. So, as uh, he kind of like uh, said, that we do have a few challenges, which is, as he mentioned, anti donor HLA antibodies can be a problem. But nowadays, we have uh, protocols to actually handle and do transplants in patients who even have high DSA antibodies. But there can be problems that there uh, are donors' illnesses may rule out some of family donors, in which case, we may not be able to do a haplo in those cases. I'll Go on to my next question, which is to Dr. Gaurav Karia. That if you're talking about doing a MUD transplants, what are the major advantages of going forward with a MUD transplant? Hi, uh, thank you, Shantanu. <coughs> so, uh, uh, I mean, this is this is a debate which I think has started uh, quite some time back since the time uh, 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 Prof. Luznik uh, showed these fantastic results with haploidentical transplants. So since then, the debate has been ongoing, whether MUD or HAPLO. Uh, <coughs> if, we, if we see, look at the initial outcomes for uh, uh, HAPLO transplant for the initial five years when PTCY strategy was introduced, uh, they were very different. And uh, uh, in, in recent times, uh, uh, they are very different. The advantage uh, for, for MUD transplant, I think uh, it's, it's well-established modality, treatment modality. So, so uh, all of us know that there is no difference in the outcomes of transplant uh, uh, when we use a MUD donor, 10 on 10 MUD donor, uh, as compared to a MAD sibling donor. And uh, more or less, they behave uh, in a similar fashion. So MUD transplants, MUD donors, they behave in a similar fashion to MAD sibling donors. So it's an it's a established modality with a pretty good experience. With, with these new modalities, what is lacking is that we don't know what will be the uh, 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 course or what will be the long-term toxicities uh, five years, 10 years or 15 years down the line, which is uh, which is not there with mud transplant. So it's established modality. So that is the most important advantage of mud. Then subsequently, uh, uh, other advantages are like uh, if you have the option of uh, choosing uh, various mud donors. Uh, so then you can look for other factors which, which might fit in best for your particular uh, uh, patient. Then uh, uh, other strategies are, uh, I mean, uh, most of the times in country like India, as Satendra has already highlighted, uh, we very often see the DSA positivity. Uh, yes, there are strategies uh, uh, to, to desensitize a patient who has a donor-specific antibody positivity, but they are also expensive. So if you have a patient who is having a DSA with MFI of around 8,000, 10,000, which is not uncommon in, in, in our uh, setting, then to desensitize that patient is going to take a, 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 a hell lot of a task. You do plasma exchange, three to four plasma exchange, you give it a map. So that is also uh, uh, expensive. 
and subsequently also uh, there will be a big question mark whether using a myoablative or a reduced intensity conditioning because with reduced intensity the risk of rejection can never be negated with myoablative yes uh, you have little bit better chances so these are the advantages of mud transplant over haploantical transplant but having said this uh, i i would say that uh, both these modalities have their own uh, 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 pros and cons and uh, uh most of the times our approach is sort of individualized based on the setting which we are dealing with i think that's a very very important point that we can't just go with one modality and we really need to see the patient see the whole disease and decide uh shweta uh we talked about all the advantages of a mud do we have any drawbacks of doing a mud transplant yeah so it's an interesting question actually when we are talking as adam has said in his uh, talk also though they are finding uh, easy um, they are having a long um, registries for mud still they are finding haplo transplants much more easier as compared to mud and good results are seen so when we talk about disadvantages of mud i would say like it depends upon the center center experience and also in which part of the world you are living in so um like uh, i would say in the developing countries where the registries are limited searching a right donor is always a difficult uh, thing and it takes a lot of time to search a right donor then motivating them to donate and uh, mobilizing the stem cell is always a task and it takes a lot of time and for leukemia or malignancies patients a uh, time is a uh, is an important thing so getting a right donor at the right time is very very important secondly uh, definitely uh, getting a mud uh, is all is an expensive uh, uh, proposition because uh, getting uh, the cost are involved in uh, maintaining the registries then uh, performing the searches and also getting the uh, this mud stencils from the uh, donors uh, place to the transplant center uh, is always uh, the logistics are involved and especially in the covid area covid era we are finding it very difficult there was there i would say like in our center also we had a patient of aml uh, who had relapsed and required a transplant we found at least 6 10 by 10 mud transplant in the registry but we were not able to motivate any of them because of the covid issues even even um, this uh, agree to uh, give the stem cells but we were not able to get the um, stem cells in our center because of the various restrictions in different states so these are the issues definitely we are we face when uh, we are mobilizing the mud and definitely when we are having a difficulty in arranging the stem cell arranging a dli for the high risk uh, patients again becomes a major major issue so these are the major uh, drawbacks i would say with the mud which we don't see in happy patients yeah absolutely i mean and especially as you rightly pointed out with the uh, covid era upon us and limitation in movement and travel it had become quite difficult to do mud transplants but thankfully it had started there was issues were sorted out we have a very typical uh, very kind of like a strange issue sometimes and this has happened spe- specifically in india that we do have another problem of a donor who can suddenly go a wall at the last minute which mean, means a disaster for everybody around involved in the transplant so just to sum up so the, the uh, kind of like a quick ca- comparison between a haplo and a matched and related donor is of course much much easier to get a haplo donor almost each and every patient can get a donor available for a transplant it is quicker it is uh, faster to go from collection to infusion and of course it's much more easier to go down the pathway of either a repeat to donation or a dli as and when we need to uh can i ask you ratna please i mean what are your thoughts about outcomes of a haplo compared to a match sibling donor which still now we would take as our gold standard that whenever we are looking for a transplant for most cases i mean maybe that's the way we are conditioned that's the way we are trained for we think okay first of all let me look at a match sibling what about these two options uh ratna can you hear me is your mic on ratna we can't hear you can you check your mic yeah. please So, yeah. yeah is it on now yeah, yeah. so uh, thanks shantanu uh, so when we are you know actually comparing uh, outcomes of haplo with a match sibling donor um, a very uh, few studies especially in children you know most of the data that is coming from adult studies and there are no randomized trials which have been done these are obviously studies where they have retrospectively analyzed you know um, children who had undergone haplo transplant because the match sibling donor was not available so based on these studies available what we understand is that 
the haplo does give a overall survival which is same as a uh, mass sibling donor in fact uh, what we see less is a chronic gbhd in these patients and uh, the, what is more important is that the graft uh, you know gbhd free relapse free survivals are almost comparable which is an important thing so um, uh, they are almost comparable and in fact the advantage of chronic gbhd is seen in haplo the uh, non transplant related mortality definitely is little higher with haplo which does make it little inferior compared to mass sibling donor transplant but overall if the center is experienced i would say and is dealing with uh, you know t cell manipulated graft as well then the outcomes could be in favor of haplo and they could be comparable to mass sibling donor transplant so it all depends on the center's experience also thank you thank you very much ratna and uh, this question was a uh, kind of addressed by this uh, large uh, meta analysis that was done by uh, uh, dr uh, uh, leo lushne is shantanu audible no i shant I can't hear okay. shantanu Shantanu, can you check your system at your end? Shantanu, I think you'll have to refresh it. Can someone from the support team help him, please? So while Shantanu joins back in, um, I would like to ask a question. uh whenever you're thinking about a haploidentical transplant what is the level of dsa that you're looking at uh, uh, when you choose your haploidentical donor um can i ask dr sunil to answer that question um so uh richard you know any kind of dsa is uh, you know um, is 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 bad um so you know the, the, there are two settings one is uh, what you call as uh, um no dsi no dsas then you know what we say uh, uh, a low level of dsa and high level of dsa um so it has been seen that outcomes of course when the dsas are high uh, are definitely suboptimal and uh, and that difference becomes even more significant in non malignant transplants where you get high rates of rejection uh, as a consequence of dsi less pronounced in malignancies though um but you know uh, what to do is uh, you know can we uh if someone has got a high dsa a positive dsa we do there are two options one we can do is uh, we desensitize them or change the donor so if a option of changing the donor that would be the best way to go um but if there the, the donor options are not there then you have to try to de- to desensitize the donors but it's still uh, you know kind of a debate that even after desensitization the outcomes probably improve but they are not as good as if the dsa was negative so Uh, the short answer is that any dsa is is significant try to if if try to change the donor if you have if you don't have an alternative donor then you try to desensitize them before they go for transplantation so i think shantanu is back probably yeah um dr uh, ah shantanu is back i'll take the question later hi hi um can i share my screen please is the Yeah, I see your screen is visible. My screen is visible. I won't be visible, but you hopefully no, hear the voice. Yeah. And it's better. You actually you can hear me rather than see me. <laughs> okay, let's get back on. I, I think um, we were about here when we were talking uh, uh, to Ratna about uh, the data mm-hmm. that's there about match sibling versus haploid identical transplant. And as I said, Dr. Leo Lushnik had did the study, which basically showed that we have a advantage with less chronic GVHD. when we are doing a haplo identical transplant however there is a slightly high non relapse mortality okay, going on with the next question is uh, to prashant prashant uh, he worker is one of the transplanters in wadi a prashant uh, if you were to compare haplo transplants with all other types of transplants that we do we talk about match sibling match unrelated donors or even match unrelated donors so what are your thoughts about uh, the relative outcomes talking about short term talking about long term for these patients yeah th- thank you shantanu um, so so i think uh, adult data is very promising um, and the short term and long term outcomes in adults uh, are similar 
uh, in terms of TRM cure. Uh, but children are not small adults and pharmacokinetics of cyclophosphamide is different in children and adults. Um, there's interest of graft rejection, early graft rejection, which adds to the non-relapse mortality in children. Um, so I think we need more data, uh, more registry da da data um, comparing different types of transplantation in pediatrics uh, to see uh, if haploid identical transplant is truly superior in pediatrics too. And in terms of haploid identical transplant, how do you do haploid identical transplant in children? Do you use PTCY approach? or do you use T cell deplete approach is also a question that needs, needs to be answered. Uh, in the subcontinent, uh, we have MDR resistant bugs. So we use PBSC for faster engraftment and that could tweak it more towards GVHD. So, that, so we truly need a study in the subcontinent to answer the question. Uh, now, which donor to choose? It depends upon each transplant center expertise and their comfort zone whether a transplant center can deal with uncertainties of a donor from a registry or not. And which donor to use also depends on uh, what type of mismatch, what uh, donor you have and what type of disease you're dealing with. So if you have a JMML, you choose a nine on 10 donor because uh, the experience of haplo in JMML is simply not there. Uh, at least I haven't seen data in JMML. So it is disease specific as well as it is center specific, I think what donors you, you choose uh, at this point of time. Thanks. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, so as, I, sorry. I have to just a comment here, if I'm permitted. Yeah. I think yeah. I agree completely with Prashant, you know, um, although, you know, we look at these graphs, which are, you know, most of them are TRM graphs or survival graphs. Um, but, you know, the, the, we also look at the journey, you know, the journey of a patient um, has to go post-transplantation. We still have a lot of, I would say poor immune reconstitution, viral infections, um, poor graft function, which we sometimes underestimate, uh, you know, um, hemorrhagic cystitis, um, uh, as well as, you know, uh, autoimmune manifestations. A lot of them develop autoimmune manifestations later on. So, you know, still a lot of learning to do, although the graphs, you know, with math siblings especially can look, so, could look overlapping, but definitely the journey is not overlapping. The journey is a completely different and finances and economics definitely up, pulls apart. So that was just a comment, which, you know, I think you highlighted very nicely. Correct, correct. Absolutely, Sunil. I mean, as we said, sure. that this is a new journey that we are taking and uh, we are learning. I mean, certainly the early results seems to be Shantanu, great, Shantanu, but I mean, Shantanu, no. Shantanu, can I chip in? Can I ask Prashant? Prashant, what about the, you mentioned JMML, what about the complementary transplant which the Chinese group are doing for JMML, where they add a haplo and on day plus six, they add a cord. And we have started doing that. And if the cord wins, the outcomes are actually uh, excellent. So do you have any, what about, I, I know it's the cost will be more, but actually that uh, immunologically makes uh, much more sense. So do you think well, about that for JMMLs? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think uh, certainly JMML is a disease that is cure, cured by GVL effect and cord certainly offers that. Um, so uh, yeah, haplo plus cord mix have been tried in various different settings, even in the past. Uh, but, but why would you want to do haplo plus cord mix? You do cord up front. Uh, in, a, in, in a setting like that. So I've never understood why they are mixing haplo plus cord. Um, is, are they mixing to, because the cell dose in the cord is low, then it makes sense. But if the cell dose in the cord is good, then there is no point in mixing haplo plus cord. You just do a cord. No, it's actually uh, to do the immunologically, the three-way fight. And, uh, and yeah, depending okay. on Rajat, the Rajat, yeah. I, I'm going to say that, uh, yeah, yeah, can yeah, we stop. carry on? We, we still yeah. have a few more things to decide. So uh, this was basically, again, I was just very briefly talking about uh, this paper, uh, which kind of shows that we have some uh, advantages in fav favor of a haplon uh, against a mismatch and related donor. But what I wanted to do is quickly go on to some disease specific outcomes. And what I wanted to talk about is that, to, should we talk about uh, unrelated donor, matched for unrelated donor versus a haplo in acute myeloid leukemia in ALL, and then if we time, we talk, uh, have, uh, talk, have a little bit talk about relapsed lymphomas. So we have a boy with a relapsed AML who was initially treated with standard light therapy, and then he relapses after a couple of years. There is a sibling, eight-year-old. We have a father who's quite young, 36, though he has mild hypertension. Mother, 32, is healthy. 
with a case like this sunil how would you proceed what are you going to do well uh, shantanu you know for the interest of time i'll be very you know brief and um, yes, uh, to the point i see you know relapsed aml probably the e- easiest bit because alls we know it's difficult you know is different depending on type of relapse even if you know type um the prior treatment and all of that is is taken in consideration for for a consideration for transplant but in this case relapsed a- aml whatever um whenever they relapse whatever the prior treatment has been they are candidates for a transplant in you know in cr2 now whenever a patient with uh, uh, with a aml relapse comes to you i think uh, the two things have to start parallelly you have to uh, of course get them uh, started in the treatment and get them to remission but at the same time i think you need to have the parallel discussion uh, about the, the the you know the the transplant as well and what we do at our center is that once we start induction we definitely we take you know the samples for hla typing and while the you know the the induction chemotherapy is going on we have the hla typing reports back and then we have a uh, kind of a plan um, you know in place uh, of what we do uh, once you know for the consolidation what type of transplantation if there's a mud donor what what needs to be done for search initiation and other things to go in parallel so that's what we'll do at our center correct so the, so this case that the siblings and the parents uh, were all haplo identical matches the sibling was a not a full match so a donor mud donor search was initiated and the results came back that there were 2 ten out of 10 matches on the registry and quite a few 9 out of 10 matches and uh, so something like this if you get a couple of donors who are full match you choose them to go with yeah that uh, we still follow um, you know um, uh, I know we still follow this algorithm. We still would probably try to pursue for a ten by ten mud, um, you know, if at all it it fits in our timeline. As I said, time is essence here. Um, so if we have this done quite well in advance, while induction is going on, enough time on our hand, we definitely will ask the registry to um, to contact the donors, to do counselling, and see whether we can uh, within our time frame get the donor ready for a transfer of the ten by ten, and of course have have uh, you know have the backup for the uh, haplo if the donors. Um, so I just I think you were saying here that Absolutely. the donors have refused. Sorry. um yeah. i know it's a, con- a controversial statement i am making but i have stopped really doing 10 9 by 10 months uh, in our yeah. center because we know that 10 by 10 9 by 10 what we saved data from europe evmt they're same they're overlapping but i think uh, you know we we forget that that data is from bone marrow grafts uh, and we get from maybe pbac grafts and you know, my experience 9 by 10 um uh, donors definitely had a very high risk of graft versus host disease so we have stopped doing 9 by 10 months if i do not get a 10 by 10 month i would definitely go for a haplo in this setting because both the donors have refused and i will try to work up the donors of uh, the haplo donors for the transplant in this setting what Thank about you, you satendra what would you do would you choose a 9 by 10 or would you go for a haplo in your setting yeah so shantanu i will make the question easier for the colleagues uh, junior colleagues over here so 9 by 10 with dqb1 mismatch maybe okay but uh, other than dqb1 mismatch um it's a problem and uh, because bone marrow transplant is in an attempt to treat one disease we kind of introduce three diseases condition and toxicity graft versus host disease and then the viral reactivation and we hope and we plan that how do we keep them very very minimal so in that planning even with mud gvsd is an issue with 10 by 10 anything other than dqb1 mismatch in mud i will be very very you know uh, cautious taking up that uh, mud transplant though there is you know we can always talk about data but i'm you ask my personal choice i will yeah. go for the haplo now in the haplo you have said father is there 36 mother is there and the sibling is there now with the latest you know the consensus guidelines uh, written by stefan suria by pbmt almost a year back now they are saying surprisingly that probably in ptsi mother is better out of the two uh, the parents and in the tree deplete probably the male and the father is going to better so that's where you know how you are going to do is we will decide based on that but i will choose a haplo rather than an unmatched one gaurav yeah what's your opinion about the outcomes of a haplo when you're doing it in aml compared to a mud yeah so i mean it's quite premature to to comment on it especially in the pediatric setting as as uh, right. as prashant highlighted uh, uh, in his version that uh, most of the data whatever we have is from the adult cohorts and that that uh, that uh, undoubtedly is very promising and shows that uh, 
uh, the haplo cohort has uh, has a little bit edge over the mat cohort but in in pediatric setting unfortunately we do not have data and and pediatric patients cannot be compared to adult patients uh, so uh, i mean in this scenario uh, uh, we'll definitely go for a haplo uh, uh, but uh, to comment on it that uh, we have some data to to Uh, prognosticate the family that uh, based on these particular criteria we can say that the outcome will be like this it it, it is difficult okay so that's actually very very relevant to our specialty that almost all the data that we have currently is coming to us from the adult world pediatric uh, trials and pediatric data is simply not there and that's something we have to wait for the data from the adult world right now seems to suggest that uh, when we actually compare an allo transplant between a haplo and a mud the outcomes are more or less the same in terms of uh, leukemia free survival overall survival so certainly haplo has an advantage in terms of reduced chronic gvhd and there are multiple studies including single center elsewhere all of which kind of showed the same data that in aml patients certainly in the adult world the outcomes are more or less similar wherever we look at and so this is what the current adult data is and i cannot stress that enough that this is adult data that currently overall haplo seems to have a survival advantage over mud and certainly in terms of reduction in chronic gvhd that seems to be slightly better what we can maybe we might be a little bit premature in saying this but maybe we can surmise that haplo might just be an equally good option as a mud when we are talking about a uh, aml transplant let me go on to my next case which is basically one of our uh, patients who had a relapse in all and uh, we this was an only child so an uh, sibling transplant was out of the question younger parents we did a mud search and we only found 8 by 10 matches in this case shweta something like this would you prefer a haplo over a mud Shantanu, I think it's an easy choice if there is a eight by ten ma mud is available. So I would definitely go for haplo in this case. Having said that, like uh, whatever the data is available and whatever the experience we have, we know that with the match and related donors, if they are not ten by ten match, there is definitely a very high risk of GBHD and even the rejection is there. So uh, considering the um, you know, the various complications associated with the transplant, I will definitely go for a haplo in this case if there is only eight by ten searches are available. Thank you, Ratna. What if you have a fully matched and related donor transplant for this patient? So uh, if there is a debate between you know haplo or a mud for a ALL who has a ten by ten mud. uh children again the studies are very few as you know and one of the study which was published in august 2020 by the bfm group where they talked about the very high risk leukemic children who were more than 2 years of age so this was one of the study in children which was published they they found that the haplo results were definitely good in fact the uh, ex- other than the um, nrms you know uh, rest all was as comparable to uh, mud uh, transplant and uh, even the four year even free survival that they got was uh, better uh, with uh, uh, the haplo so th- that was one of the study which really you know is encouraging <coughs> to go in for haplo even in the presence of 10 by 10 mud considering the cost of the mud and uh, the timeline you know of procuring the harvest and uh, and in pristine in our setup where we have patients where putting in the amount of money required to uh, mobilize a mud is very high so um, with uh, these results it might be worth attempting a haplo again with the experience of the center it matters what you're going to be doing thank you um as ratna says that again we have the same issues that we don't have much of uh, specific pediatric data but there was this paper that was published in the advances from the acute leukemia working party of the ebmt and that kind of showed that at least in that population and you have to realize ebmt doesn't kind of like separate between adults and peds the outcomes are grossly similar so at least in all also we can say that there is some evidence to say that you're looking at almost equivalent outcomes though their ebmt data suggested that mud had a slightly higher survival advantage 
advantage. Haplo kind of trumped off with slightly lower chronic GVHD, but the difference was certainly not significant. So we can certainly say even in ALL, we can consider a haplo donor with the PT side because the outcomes are more or less similar. I come to you, Prashant. I mean, I know that pediatric lymphomas are not that common, but uh, as in our, we pediatric lymphoma patients, we take for a transplant. But uh, who are the patients that we should think about doing an allogenic transplant? And then if you could tell us briefly about the current understanding of haplo versus mud in lymphomas. So I think in the interest of time, this was covered by Dr. Revti just a few minutes ago. Correct. Um, so T-cell, LBL, relapsed refractory Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, ALCL and DLBCL are the ones you would consider uh, ones which are not chemotherapy curable. Um, and in terms of which donors, if, if you don't have MAT related or MUD, you certainly choose a haplo in this setting as well. Um, so th there's no question of question that haplo is a viable option for all malignancies. Uh, it depends upon each center how they want to do haplo, whether they want to choose PTCY or whether they want to do um, uh, alpha beta deplete with CD45 RA deplete top up. We certainly prefer alpha beta deplete with CD45 RA deplete top up because we don't like the storm of PTCY. Uh, but that's an individual choice that we make at this point of time till more data comes out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prashant. Um